Well, hello, everybody. I haven't quite figured out my background because it's blue now. <laughs> so there's this yellow filter that comes through. I haven't negotiated that yet. But well, maybe if I turn it a little bit this way. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Anyway, we are back for another live stream. Welcome back. I am very excited to chat with you all here today. If you want to type your name and where you're coming from there in the chat box, I can give you a little shout out here on the call. I see we have Tiffany from Baltimore. Welcome, Tiffany. Happy to have you here. Um, if you are just joining us, we did a live stream yesterday as well where we looked at four emotions to help process heartbreak or breakup. Um, and we got very experiential with it. So we had a download template and we were looking at how to externalize four essential feelings for releasing the pain that we experience around breakup. So if you haven't seen it, I invite you to check that out. Today, we're going to be talking about two must-haves or therapy won't work. And we're also going to talk about 10 questions to help you kind of get out of a rut. We have Chris from Copenhagen. Welcome. Nice to see you, Chris. So today, if you have ever considered seeking out therapy or counseling for issues in love, and you felt frustrated because as much as you grew to understand the problem through that process, you didn't really feel any differently. And so if that's the case, then this is a live stream segment that you are not going to want to miss. Because in it, I'm going to share two of the most essential ingredients for therapy and or self-help work to work, <laughs> and why a lot of practitioners tend to only implement one of them. And again, I'm also going to share 10 questions to help you start reframing your understanding of what is actually tripping you up in your love relationships. We also have Mark from Luxembourg. Welcome. Okay. So if you're interested in changing unhealthy patterns in your love life and you want to see some real result, results for all the time, energy, and money you're putting in to personal development and or into therapy, then you're definitely going to want to stick with me until the end here. Now, before we dive into today's topic, if you are new to my channel, welcome. My name is Brianna McWilliam, and I am a licensed and board-certified creative arts therapist, author, and educator, and I have over 13 years in the field. And it is my mission to help insecure lovers go from feeling fearful and confused in their relationships to stepping into what I call their self-sovereignty and calling in those soul-shaking, passionate partnerships that they want without having to talk in circles around their feelings for hours or even years on end with no tangible result. And I do this using what I call the McWilliam method, and it fosters expanding consciousness and secure attachment using three practical tools, and that is cognitive reframing, body activation, and arts-based experientials. And this is also that you can start putting insight into action. And so make sure that you are subscribed and ring the bell for notifications because I do put out videos on YouTube on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I often do live stream series like this on a monthly basis, and I don't want you to miss out. So let's dive into today's topic. Now, I want to just start by saying that it is really good to talk about stuff, to vent, to get it off your chest, to just get it all out, right? And to do this while developing a relationship with someone that truly cares, but maybe doesn't have such a deep personal stake in your life and in your relationships, that can be a really valuable tool. And I am not denying that. I am a licensed psychotherapist myself. Of course, I endorse therapy, especially if there is a history of trauma. However, therapy can be more or less useful depending on how well both the therapist and the client access two things. But before we discuss those two things, I want to examine the problem first. So for partners with insecure attachment, they may often wonder why all the insight in the world doesn't seem to be changing how they actually feel. Or why is it that they can seem to spot every red flag under the sun and yet still find themselves magnetized to the same unhealthy partners over and over again? Now, if you have an insecure attachment style and you struggle with anxiety or avoidance or swinging between the two, you might find yourself being accused of being too much or too intense or a lot or being told that you're too moody or you're confusing or you're too needy. On the other hand, maybe you're told that you're cold and you're aloof or you're uncaring or you're too callous. And maybe your partner calls you high maintenance, but then somehow they seem to be attracted to the very drama that they are criticizing you for. So a reasonable, a reasonable person might assume that analyzing pivotal moments in our childhood is going to somehow resolve these problems, turning talk therapy into kind of a treasure hunt for the explicit past. And, you know, autobiographical memories are useful, but explicit memory is not a shrine. 
People rely on the rational mind to solve problems, and they're usually baffled when it proves useless to affect real emotional change. And a lot of therapists, especially talk therapists, do this too. And so recounting a timeline of your past by itself is not going to help you navigate your way out of these muddy waters. So you have to engage in relationships, of course, see what comes up in the present and be able to withstand the discomfort of when your wires cross. This could be with a romantic partner, but it could also be with your extended relationships. So when those wires cross long enough, at least to determine the origin of the conflict and whether or not it's rectifiable. But keep in mind that those wires can change, but not when left alone, not when left in isolation, and not when only addressed in the context of the past. And of course, not if you are only talking about it. So for these kinds of therapeutic and or let's call them transformational processes to be effective, whether it's in therapy or some other form of healing methodology or relationship coaching, for example, it really has to combine two things. And the first is a raising of consciousness, which is a shift in mindset. And the second is affective experiences. So affect is a word that we might say could be synonymous with energy. Now, oftentimes affect is described in terms of our body language, our tone of voice, the way we are feeling. But those are all just expressions of your affect, which is the way your energy manages to manifest itself. So in essence, it is an enlivening of your senses. It is a grounding and a balancing of energy in your body. Now, most people get number one, and therapists included. They totally get the mindset stuff. But the body feels very foreign to them. And this is true of a lot of practitioners out there. So psychology and the study of psychotherapeutic professions are by nature very heady topics. And because the field as a whole is considered to be a soft science, it's very concerned with proving itself to a medical model by hanging its hat on evidence-based practices. And this is not unlike you know, the anxious child chasing after an emotionally unavailable parent for approval. But this type of research, by virtue of its data collecting instruments and statistical measures, often discount subjective and qualitative experiences, which are the very things that this soft science seeks to understand, similar to the way a dismissive parent negates the efforts of the said anxious child. So a qualitative, let's, let's define qualitative experience. So qualitative experiences are really the meat of our experience of reality. It is the salami between the two slices of bread. And they are primarily expressed through our emotional, nonverbal, and visceral bodily experiences. So I would have you consider this. Everything you experience is filtered through the body. Okay. You know when you're having a feeling, you know when you're sad or upset because your body feels it first. Your throat closes up, your chest feels tight, you get butterflies in your stomach. For example, you hurt your arm and that gets translated into an electrical impulse in your brain and it says pain, pain. So you learn to stay away from whatever hurts your arm. Now let's say you have a negative thought about yourself and that too gets translated to, into an electrical impulse in the brain and in the body and it says pain, pain, ouch, that feels bad. But do we stop thinking that bad thought? Do we avoid thinking that bad thought? Well, here's a hint for you. Secure people don't, while well, insecure people or secure people do try to stop thinking it. Insecure people don't, okay? And I'm gonna talk about that in just a minute. Because when you are cut off from your feelings, you are cut off from your body. And that comprises our ability to respond to natural cues in attachment lingo, we call this attunement, and to move towards a state of integration and love. So you might wind up feeling dissociated. It might look like being prone to fantasy, intellectualizing, rationalizing, and overthinking the bejesus out of everything. Now, importantly, your body tells you when your thoughts are not in alignment with what I'm going to call your true self. Psychologists might say your unconscious self. But for now, I'm going to refer to this as the true self, which is the essence of being. And here's how it works. So you have a crappy thought. And your unconscious true self, whatever you want to call it, might say, wow, that's a crappy thought. I have to make sure that my conscious self realizes it so we can stop that crappy thinking right away. So your unconscious or true self makes your body feel bad so you can realize just how crappy that thought really is. And so then your mind and body feel pain, which is supposed to make you address the crappy thinking, not 
repress it or deny it, but name and claim the limiting belief that is being used as usurping the body's resources, right? And so if you can allow that feeling to move through you without resorting to short-term escapes or addictions, then you're actually listening to the message that the body's trying to send you about that terrible thinking. But often we interpret these crappy thoughts as proof positive that the crappy thought is true and it only makes your thoughts and your feelings worse. Additionally, sometimes we are unaware of all the crappy thoughts and beliefs that are operating under the radar because we don't frequently engage in self-reflection. So if you experience a lot of conflict in your relationships and even a high level of depression and anxiety in your daily life, it's likely that your core beliefs tend to paint a distorted picture of reality because your need for survival which in this context here is a preservation of your attachment relationships, tends to trump the upholding of your consciously held values. Okay, so this is where we're going to get into the second part. So here are 10 questions that are going to help you start to raise your consciousness around your felt experiences. Okay, so number one, what is one significant change that you would like to see in your life right now? And this is where we're going to get some engagement here on the call. I would love for the 31 people who are watching this right now, for a couple of you to type that in the chat box there. What is one significant change that you would like to see in your physical reality right now? Or it could even be an internal process that you're going through. What is something that you would like to experience, let's say, differently? then you are experiencing it right now. And I would love to see that in the chat box there, if you can put it in there for me. Um, we have some comments here. I have this thing that I get hurt very easily by other people, even by words. Mm -hmm. And I cannot protect myself. It comes definitely from childhood with therapy, affective body activation. Would you recommend, please? I feel my legs frozen, etc., and later I'm upset with myself. Well, I would actually have you go back and watch the video, live stream video that we did yesterday because the process that we went through, which was very experiential, is the very same process that I would access with you. So when, when you feel that blown over by the responses of the people around you and or your environment, it's typically because you're struggling with a lack of boundaries right? You're, you're not able to discern what's yours, what's theirs. You're not able to hold your center. So if I were to work with this, we would start with inside outside stuff. What's me? What's you? We would, there's lots of arts based um, interventions and creative experientials that work with that on a nonverbal level, because that's really where it starts, especially if you attribute it to attachment wounding. So, so it starts with becoming aware of and making connections with the inner space and experiencing it as safe enough to go in. So yesterday we started by looking at and finding a safe and neutral split space in the inner space and then externalizing whatever those experiences might be. And then through that process, you start to understand what is you and what is someone else. And once you can understand that, then you start to understand your boundaries, which are kind of like these semi-permeable um, flexible membranes around different facets of your own affective expression, okay? Um, so when having a conversation, it's important to see how someone's physiology is responding. A thousand percent, especially if we're talking about individuals that are struggling with attachment wounding, right? Because when you're struggling with attachment wounding, it's primarily nonverbal. You know, it's we're talking about body to body contact. If you can imagine, you know, attachment is studied most profusely from the early phases of development. And we understand secure attachment as being held and cooed and pressed close against the bodies of our caregivers, right? So it's a very bodily, visceral experience. Okay. Um, oh, I'm glad you enjoy it, Nick Nick. Nick Nick 480. Um, stop avoiding what's obvious for me to do. <laughs> know what my desires and my needs are from others. To be less anxiously attached and more emotionally mature. Okay, to be able to express my needs without fear of rejection. These are wonderful goals. Okay, so being able to just type it out right there is kind of like step one. Sometimes we don't even know why, how, what we're doing, why we're responding in the ways that we are responding. But if you're able to identify these things, then that's kind of like the first step, right? Um, knowing my needs and desires from, from others is a good one. Let's see, being able to externalize my feelings, yes. Um, without fear of rejection, right? And so, and so 
Those are great answers. Thank you for sharing those. So that is one significant change, or let's say think, the thing that you want to experience differently right now. Now, the second question is, what are the emotional reasons that you might have in order to make that change? So what are the emotional reasons you might want to make that change? So for example, um, I would want to change that because I want to have more confidence. I want to feel worthy of regard. I want to believe in myself. I want to trust my own intuition. Um, I want a sense of agency, right? So just let me know in the chat box there, what, which one of these feels true for you? Why, why do you want that thing, that thing that you identified? So why do you want to know what your needs and desires are from others? Why would you want to be less anxiously attached and more emotionally mature? Um, why would you want to be able to express your needs without a fear of rejection? Why would you want to externalize your feelings, right? Um, to be more open and giving and receiving physical touch and love in general from people in my life. Why? <laughs> why would you want that? How do you imagine that would... Um, well, that's the next question. Why would you want that? I struggle with depression, anxiety. I hate obsessing on people I can't be with. So, so, so what is the wanting? So what is the wanting? I want to not obsess, right? So wanting obsessing versus not obsessing isn't really a desire. It's more like pushing and pulling against the same momentum and energy. It would be, um, that I'm in complete command of where I put my focus, right? Um, because it's healthy, I don't know. <laughs> what is healthy? What is healthy? What If you were to paint a picture of healthy, what is that, right? You gotta get into the specifics. To be myself, to be healthy, to be, to be truth, true to myself and my family. I don't trust my choices. I want to trust my choices and thus feel safe. Yes. So safety sort of becomes the foundation of that, right? I want a feeling of safety. I want to have complete trust in myself and know that the decisions that I am making are stemming from a place of agency, right? Personal agency. I want to believe in myself, right? And almost always this comes back to having a trust in the self, right? So Anytime we're experiencing um, conflict, conflict or contrast in our relationships, it almost always stems from some level of distrust in the self, right? I need to learn to be more comfortable being open with others, right? Why? What, what emotional reward do you think that would, that would bring you? And that's actually the next question. So what are the external concrete rewards of experiencing this change or this difference Right. So, for example, well, if I had a deeper sense of trust in myself and I wasn't so anxious and I didn't have such a fear of rejection, I think I might enjoy dating more. Right. I think I might like taking vacations alone and exploring the world at my own pace. I think I might focus more on business building because I'm not so afraid of failure anymore. I think I might actually pick up a hobby. Right. Because I would be more interested in doing things just for the pure pleasure of doing them as opposed to having some kind of product or outcome that is for the approval of somebody else. Right. I think I might explore more of my passions. Why? Because I'd be more in touch with myself and I'd know what the hell my passions are. Right. So what are some of the concrete action oriented things that you feel like you might be able to do? So we are talking about action in the physical world and the doing now. If you were able to experience the change you want to see and you were to have the emotional rewards of that change, what would be the external rewards? What would be the concrete rewards, right? Um, healthy, mature, and confident in myself. Having feelings for older women make seem really issues. Okay, we'll come back to that question. I want to develop tools in myself to help foster a comfortable environment so my colleague can pursue their passions because I know how it is to be in an uncomfortable environment. To help foster a comfortable environment so my colleagues can pursue their passions because I know how it is to be. So, so Christopher, I would have you look more deeply at that desire. So I want to make a comfortable environment so other people can be more comfortable. And I'm more comfortable if other people are comfortable, right? So there's a there's a, um, there's a little bit of an abandonment of self there. So I'm going to ask you in this question to be selfish, 
right? To be super selfish. Because I feel like on the opposite side of this desire, there's 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 actually a fear you're expressing, which is that if other people are uncomfortable, then I can't be comfortable. So the fear is is about, I don't actually have control over my own feelings and I can't accomplish a sense of balance and equilibrium unless everyone around me is in a, is in a positive state of mind, right? So the desire is actually that I want to feel like I am in complete command of my own emotional self and equilibrium such that I can create an uncomfortable environment for others simply by being comfortable within myself. And I can allow for somebody else to have an uncomfortable feeling if they need to experience that because I acknowledge that everyone in their own experience has a right to their own contrasts and conflicts and to know the feeling of being uncomfortable because I cannot possibly know what wonderful things could be birthed from their experience of contrast in that moment. So that is really more a deeper desire going on there. I'm working on emotional wounds to healing. I'm struggling with this. I'm working on this every day. Okay, so we're gonna come back to this notion of healing. I want it because it's exactly what I need. I know my uncomfortable reactions come from the way I was raised, but it's very much what I need to feel loved as an adult. Okay, so to feel love, to let love in, to be able to receive. Mm -hmm. I would know to put my energy in sustainable ways and allow desires and development. Okay, so consistency, sustainability, that all speaks to personal agency. Being my authentic self, I imagine I would enjoy dating somebody more. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, these are all great answers. Okay, so... For those of you just joining us, we're talking about 10 questions that can help us kind of get to the root of what is going on with our relationships. And the first one was, what is one significant change that you would like to see and or to make in your life right now? The second question is, what are the emotional reasons you might want to make that change? The third question is, what would be the external concrete rewards of changing? And that's what we're talking about right now. Now on a scale of, this is number four, on a scale of one to 10, one being, I don't want it, and 10 being, I have a deep desire for this. How would you rate your desire for the change that you're, you're wanting to see? How intense is that desire, right? Well, I want it, I want it like a 10, right? So do you, do you really want it like a 10? Because if you really wanted that like a 10, there are some other things that would have to change, right? We're going to talk about that in a minute. By expressing myself openly, I would be free of the thoughts in my head. I could focus on things which I would normally find important. Okay. Growing up with um, ASD made me very self-conscious to when others are uncomfortable. Thank you for verbalizing. That helps. Oh, good. I'm glad. Okay. So, so on a scale of one to 10, one being I don't want this and 10 being I have a very deep desire for this, how would you rate the intensity of your desire for the change that you want to make? And I'd have you type that in the chat box there right now. Scale of one to 10, one not important, 10 is really important to me, right? Um, we gotta feel it to heal it, right? So while you're responding to that, I wanna just touch upon what has been kind of coming up in the feed. I want to heal, I want to be healthy, this and that. So the danger of, of using words like healing, the minute you, you say something like, I want to heal, you are simultaneously making a judgment about yourself. And you're saying, you are describing yourself as not healed, which means that you are describing yourself as not good enough, not at this state of being, which is somehow way over there at point B. And, and, and it's like this carrot in front of your nose and you're always chasing it, right? And so rather than think of, so healed is kind of this idea that I have to collect all my puzzle pieces and put the puzzle back together in order to be whole. But I would rather have you think of it in a different way. So I want to give you a metaphor. Um, I want you to think of it as, as this process of healing. Let's sort of reframe that as a process of unfolding. Because when we talk about healing, it's this supposition that something has to be fixed. But I would have you maybe adopt the notion that nothing about you has to be fixed. It's just that you have to sort of peel back the layers that have come to obscure what is already there, what is already healthy, right? So imagine you have a light bulb and the light bulb is glowing and it's illumination. And then you have, you know, life experiences that over time start to splash like a black paint on that light bulb and it gets a little dusty and there's this grime that kind of forms over it. Now, I would prefer to have you think of if we are to to, to translate healing into unfolding, then imagine that the process of 
you know, healing or the process of unfolding is actually more about wiping off the grime and the soot and the paint and the things that have accumulated over this bulb. But behind it, the bulb never stopped shining. Behind it, the bulb is not broken or burned out. Behind it, the bulb is still brightly illuminated as much as it ever was. It does not need to be healed. It just needs to be unobscured. Okay, so I would, I would, if that changes anything in the way that you are approaching it, I would encourage you to start to think of it that way. So we have a 10, we have a nine, we have a nine, we have a 10. Yes, okay, great. Now here's the next question. Um, let's see, a seven, I don't feel capable. Yes, Rebecca, thank you for, for being so honest about that. And yes, an eight, right. And, and so this is, this is where we're going to move on to the next question, question five, which is, again, on a scale of one to ten. One being, I don't value it, and ten being, I place the highest value on this, right? Um, what, how much are you valuing the rewards of that change? So we know how much you want it. I know I really want it because I think the rewards are going to be this. So we know you value the concept of change, but how much do you actually value the rewards of it? Now, why am I asking that? Well, because oftentimes when we are value, there's something that we are valuing in our current experience that prevents us from making the change, right? So for example, um, I really value this notion of showing up authentically and honestly in relationships. And I really like the idea of that. And I. On a 10, I wish that I could do that, but I question my ability to do that because I believe X, Y, Z, right? I'm not 100% sure that I'm worthy of it. I'm not 100% sure that I could sustain a healthy relationship even if I had it, right? So as much as you may value the rewards of change, you may not value it as much as you value being safe in remaining at the status quo because there's a level of safety in that because it's a coping skill that you've learned over your past experiences and to step into learning something new means to make yourself vulnerable right so while you're not risking failure you're not risking rejection you're not risking exposure you're not risking um, a torrent of negative self-talk that might occur if you were to open up in that way right so so on a scale of one to ten how, let's say, let's change this a little bit. Let's say on a scale of one to 10, one being there's no momentum tied up in that and 10 being there's a lot of momentum tied up in that. How much momentum do you feel like you have tied up in some limiting beliefs about your ability to make that change, right? So so on a scale of one to 10, one being no moment, no momentum, 10 being a lot of momentum, how much momentum do you have tied up in some limiting beliefs around your ability to make the change you want to see? So we have a seven, we have an eight, yes. I still have blocks in my life, still working on healthy change, right? It still hurts, a three, okay. Yeah, so, so realistically, I don't feel capable, mm-hmm. I think most of us simply desire to feel better about ourselves, sure, yeah. Okay, so so what do you think is preventing you from making that change? And is there any way in which you might be misdiagnosing your obstacle or your or or that issue? So that's number six. So if you're like, yes, I know that I must have some limiting beliefs that are preventing me from making this change or from really allowing myself to step into change, what might some of those beliefs be? And if you could type that in the chat box, I would love to see that. A quote I like goes something like, be careful of using your suffering as justification for your existence. That's a really good one. Um, I actually have a video called, um, why be in relationship? If I can meet my own needs, why be in relationship? And I talk about the role of suffering and the way that we connect with people. Still hurting a six, I'm still working on myself. Thank you. An eight, childhood trauma, okay. A seven, still at a 10. That's great, Nikki, you're highly motivated. Self-doubt, right? Childhood trauma and young adult trauma. So trauma is an interesting word. Trauma is an interesting word because it means so many things to different people. And trauma is really qualified by a sense of helplessness. And of course, um, it's hard to standardize a definition of that because 
because everyone, because what your experience of something, the experience of helplessness, the experience of a loss of control, the experience of being betrayed and or abandoned by community and by the people who are supposed to protect you, right? That our subjective experience of that may vary, right? Because there could be what we might generally qualify as a traumatic event. And for one person, they experience it that way. And for somebody else, they have a sense of resiliency and it doesn't impact them in the same fashion. So I think it's important to realize that when we experience trauma, we're, we're talking about an essential sense of helplessness, of being betrayed or abandoned by our larger communities and those that are supposed to protect us, and also feeling a loss of agency, right? So, so when we have that kind of experience, then, um, then we are going to develop some some beliefs around how we cope with that. And then that follows us into later adulthood. So for example, let's say a child comes home and they have a parent that's kind of unpredictably explosive. Um, and so a child comes home and, but maybe they always know that when the parent comes home, um, you know, dad has a drink and then gets loud and sort of picks a fight with whoever crosses his path. So the child learns, okay, when dad comes home, I got to go and hide in order to keep the peace. Right. So the child grows up, gets into a relationship, and anytime something emotionally stimulating um, or some level of emotional contrast occurs in the relationship, they learn, oh shit, I gotta go hide in order to keep the peace. And but and yet the other partner's like, wait, you've just abandoned me. Whereas this other person's like, what do you mean? I'm trying to preserve the relationship. So this is where our childhood traumas start right writing these narratives for us in our adult lives right and then we've got these beliefs about well i want to be emotionally available but i have this belief that if i show up in an emotionally available way it's going to lead to a conflict and it's going to dissolve this relationship so those are very deep-seated things that we have to work with right um okay so number seven that was number six number seven what would be the rewards of not changing? So we kind of talked about this, I'll touch upon this a little bit more. So like, for example, I don't risk failure. I don't have to be vulnerable. There's less of a chance of getting hurt. I don't have to face the unknown, right? I don't have to revise my sense of self and identity. So in the chat box there, if you'd be willing to share with me, are there any rewards of not changing? What are the benefits of, of maintaining the status quo? What have been the benefits of the ways in which you've coped with things up until this point? Why do you think you even deal with things the way that you do, right? Because it does serve you in some fashion, even if that sounds, even if that sounds counterintuitive, if it's something that you're struggling to change, then it's likely that there's some aspect of that that does still continue to serve you in some way. And it serves you in such a way that it is protecting a very vulnerable part of you, right? So um, I encourage you to type that there in the chat box. What are some of the things that, what are the rewards of not changing? Because it's important to realize that because once you realize that, then you can start to really dig into what I call the false premises, right? Of, of the things that we think we want. I thought I had a great childhood till I began my personal growth journey, angry, yelling, dis dissidence, and general neglect. Yes, I'm still a 10 because too many malfunction, failed relationships, tired of it, and I'm almost 40. I'm just beginning to learn about attachment. It's a sick joke God plays on us, whereas anxiously attached connect with avoidance. Um, uh, I can stay in my comfort of isolation. Yes, <laughs> Rebecca. I am there with you <laughs> as I do a live stream in the quiet corner of my room away from everybody in the world because I've constructed my whole career to be able to sit by myself in a room all day. <laughs> yes, we can continue to pretend. Yes. Oh, that's a good one. That is a good one. We can continue to fantasize because in the realms of pretend and fantasy, there's not so much contrast to have to work with, right? Compliance, loyalty to my family. Yes, a sense of belonging. Ooh, that is a tough cord. That is a tough cord to cut if you feel like it's required because belongingness is so essential and hardwired into us, right? Um, the, go the good gifts that I have inside me that people love about me and my goodness and unconditional love and friendship. That's a great reward. Um, staying, staying in the comfort zone, right? That's a reward of, of re maintaining the status quo. The most critical need for me is connection and going after desires will make the people I care for reject me. You know, this is a really good one too, because oftentimes 
wherever we are vibing at, we have surrounded ourselves with people who are vibing at the same level, right? And something happens, usually some kind of catalytic experience of contrast in your life. And you're like, wow, wherever I'm vibing at right now isn't actually where I want to be. It's kind of like you've been, you realize that you've been wearing a pair of shoes that just don't fit you anymore. And you, but you love these shoes. You love these shoes. You, they're broken in. They feel good. They just slip on your feet. And you're like, oh, I just don't want to give up these shoes. And maybe even go and you try and resole them. But somehow, you know, like the leather's just so rough and tough, it's just not happening anymore. And you're like, oh, but if I give up these shoes, I just don't know if I'm ever going to find another pair that fits me as well. Right. And that's kind of like you have, you, it's almost like sometimes you, the people who are with us is sort of like misery loves company. I think we were talking about suffering somewhere earlier on here in the feed where Sometimes we find people who connect with us through our suffering. And when we reach a place where we're like, you know what? I don't want my connections to be birthed from suffering anymore. I want my connections to be birthed from inspiration. And I want my, my connections to be birthed from a sense of increasing expansion in the world. And that can be really scary. That kind of sometimes also translates into a fear of success. There's not just a feel of fear of failure. There's also a fear of success. And actually, sometimes the two go together. Because when you become successful... Then you're like, what if I outgrow the friends that I had? What if I outgrow my family? What if I surpass my parent? What if you have a parent that competes with you on a very subconscious, unconscious, nonverbal level, right? And then you're like, well, then we have all these internal gateways and blocks to succeeding on our own because then we're like, am I giving up some aspect of my identity? Am I destroying an attachment relationship if I succeed in what I want to do? And that becomes a very difficult block to move past, right? Carrying a fear of, is my Asperger's showing? Ooh, yes. So feelings of, of shame, worrying about stigma, those are big ones, right? Feeling, feeling, yes, I hear that. Thank you for sharing that. Why I sat on the sidelines of dating for years. Mm. Um, reward for not changing is that I won't get hurt again. Yes, that's another big one, right? Because then you don't make yourself vulnerable to being wounded. And I know that one. Thank you for sharing that, okay? So again, we're just gonna do the one through 10. So this is question number eight. Okay, so now all of these are reasons, rewards of not changing. How high do you value that, right? So before we took a look at the, the rewards of changing and we put how high of a value we place on that, right? So Nikki, for example, I'm gonna use you for an example here. We're like, I'm a 10, I want this to change. I, I highly value the rewards of changing. But also you mentioned sitting on the sidelines because you didn't want to get hurt. So how highly do you value not being hurt, right? Um, so that's something that I would also say to everyone else here on the call. If you want to put that in the chat box there on a scale of one to 10, one being no, I don't value that, 10 being I do value that. So like how highly do you value not being hurt, right? How maybe another way of saying it is like how willing are you to be hurt in order to accomplish that reward sort of like I read a it's probably a meme or something I read today but it was like the only way to get good at rejection is to practice it <laughs> right you got to get good at rejection if you want to get good at rejection you got to practice it <laughs> and you know nothing teaches you about how to get good at rejection like dating I'm ready for the pain now I think well that's wonderful so you are highly motivated Right. So Rebecca, I'll call you out. How highly do you value remaining in your comfort zone versus getting the thing that you want? Right. Who else shared something? Um, Raj, how, or I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. We can continue to pretend. So how highly do you value the ability to continue to pretend? How highly do you value the fantasy life? Right. How highly? OK, I'm willing. So about a seven. OK, great. No pain, no gain. <laughs> well, that's an, we could break that one down, right? That's really, that's, that's the, uh, the suffering. Suddenly, suddenly in-laws demeaning me for being a stay-at-home mom. Husband says I'm lazy. I was happy in my role. Apparently money and income is more valued by my husband and his mom. Well, you know, it's interesting. Could also be about sinking into, there's some, there could be something about, um, Actually, what's coming up for me is that there's an element of the feminine 
that's being expressed both through your through his mother and through him, like a dismissal of the feminine, um, and that you're sinking into the role of mother, and that you're you're becoming more internal even by staying home. Like you're inside the house. There's there's a very feminine, um, powerfully feminine aspect that's coming through. And if him and his mother are are being mean about that, I would have you read the book. Um, the Heroine's Journey by Maureen Murdoch. I think it will illuminate a lot for you in the process where you're at right now. Mm -hmm. A five, because I've been hurt so many times, people don't want to hear your traumas. Others love um, others love the time of day to, not sure what the reserve, maybe? I'm still working on this truthfully to grow spiritually more inside myself. Right. So, you know, Mark says, four, I'm sad about losing my family. Yes. Mm-hmm to myself and want to get myself in healthier getting good at rejection is practicing wow you nailed it with that <laughs> i've been working on understanding that being hurt is a possibility but i need to be vulnerable through a self-progress i'm now learning a lot about myself from my biggest heartbreak two years ago yeah i think if we're here we're sick of the old patterns well yes so so but this kind of goes back to that whole thing where it's like yeah i know what my problems are and I don't like them. And then never lifting a finger to change it. Because a lot of people do that, right? So many people have tremendous, tremendous insight and awareness around exactly what their problems are. And they usually have tremendous, tremendous insight and awareness around exactly what their partner's problems are and everyone else's problems are around them. And never lift a finger to actually change it, right? And that's the difference between insight and action. That's the bridge between insight and action. And that's like, the Matt William method, why we do first there's cognitive reframing. So that is insight and consciousness raising is required, but then you got to bring it down into the body. And we do that through body activation and arts-based experientials is the role of creativity. So creativity is in fact, your ability to wield the power of making worlds, which is, exists within you, right? That is when the creativity is the bridge between the body and the mind, because that's where you start to play in that space between them, you start to take ideas and you start to take the visceral experience and you start playing with them in this space in between. And that's where the sense of agency truly comes from. That's when you start taking intention and using intention to mold not only your thoughts about reality, but the way you move through and experience your reality, right? So that's the role of creativity as it pertains to, as it is a bridge between mind and body, right? Insight and action, okay? So, um, okay, great. So we are, we, there's a, to some degree, we do value, um, the status quo. And so the, the reason I asked this question is because the higher you value the status quo, you want to compare it to the number you put to how high you value the rewards of changing. And let's say the, the closer they are on the same level, the more dissonance you're going to feel. So let's say, you, oh, I really want to change. I'm a 10. And you're like, I really value it. Okay, so how high do you value where you are right now, the status quo, the thing that you don't have to confront by not changing? So, for example, I value not getting hurt. Well, how, how high do you value not getting, getting hurt? <laughs> well, it's a seven. So if you have a 10 for change, but a seven for not wanting to change, you can see there's going to be a lot of contrast, internal conflict and contrast that you're experiencing. We'll call it dissonance, right? Now, if you say, well, I really want to change, and I'm only valuing not getting hurt by like a two or a three. You know, it's it's kind of tough, but you know, I'm willing to practice practice rejection so I can get good at it, right? And I'm willing to accept that just because I want some, I'm wanting something, it doesn't mean it's going to be delivered to me at the first date. I work up the nerve to go on in the next in the past two years, right? So if that's the case, then you might have you know your desire may more quickly come into your experience because there's less resistance to it. If that makes any sense. Okay. So that's why I have you think about it numerically, because sometimes it's easier for us to make comparisons in that way. So just think about how high do I value the rewards of changing? How high do I value the status quo? Right. And then take a look at the relationship between those two things. And that can help you indicate can be a nice sort of quantifiable indicator of the kind of dissonance or re internal resistance you may be experiencing. Inevitably, that translates into, you know, uh, an energetic block right? And a mindset block. Okay. Now, number nine, we're getting there. <laughs> On number nine, in your day-to-day -day life and interactions, okay, 
Would you qualify the majority of your conversations, your thoughts, and your behaviors to be in service of the change that you want to see? Or are they in service of maintaining your status quo? So thoughts, conversations, behaviors that you have on a day-to-day -day basis, are they in service of the change that you want to see? Or are they actually in service of maintaining the status quo? So if you're someone who's like, I want to have healthier relationships in my life, and you do absolutely nothing to affect that, then the things that you're doing are not in service of the change you want to see, are they? Right? So what are they? Right? And if you'd be willing to type that in the caption there, you know, sometimes I have clients who come to me and they're like, I want a healthy relationship. I want this. I want that. And of course, coming to me is a big step in that direction. But sometimes they'll say things that they'll be at a place where they're exasperated that they haven't seen the change yet. And I will say, okay, well, what have you been doing to affect that change? And they might say, well, I saw a therapist, but it didn't work. And then I'll say, well, how many sessions did you, did you see this, this therapist for? And they'll say, well, you know, three sessions. So if you're, so the majority of my audience is between the ages of 35 and 55. So if you are in the 35 to 55 range and you're just coming to this place of raising consciousness and awareness around patterns of relating to people and you've come to a place, you've developed such a desire and a need for and a longing for deep connection. And, and you finally have arrived at this place and you go to a session for three hours you have to really think about, do you think three hours is going to be enough to help reprogram 35 to 55 years of conditioning, not just from childhood, but from every subsequent experience that you have had in a culture that probably reinforces whatever dysfunctional pattern of relating you pick. And it's not, it wasn't dysfunctional at the time. It is now because you want something different, right? But whatever pattern of relating that you have, which is typically prioritizing the external above the internal, right? Prioritizing the other as opposed to the self. And so, and so we deplete ourselves of resources because we think that's what makes us good people. But you're, it's going to take real concentrated focus and effort and body activation in order for us to start to shift these patterns, okay? So what are some of the things that you're doing in your day-to-day -day interactions that are in service of the change that you want to see? So watching this video could be one, right? I'm glad you like these questions. Um, in order to negotiate with yourself, you have to figure out how much each part of you values what's on the table, a thousand percent. Instead of black and white, this is good or this is bad. Yeah, because then you can address this warmly as opposed to a tyrant, exactly. And then you can also speak to each part and find out what, like, what, is, what does it need and what is it willing to compromise on? These are good questions. I'm glad you think so. I'm glad it makes it clearer sometimes, but it usually brings painful conflict. Mm -hmm. um, they're in service of change. That's great. Okay. I need to think of this until I come to my own conclusion. I've been watching tons of YouTube videos and other books on emotional intelligence and dating. Those are great things. I'm getting a lot of real world practice. That's excellent. They are in service of the change, but I'm not currently dating, even though I've gained so many tools over the last year. Well, you know, it's interesting. Sometimes you maybe even taking a break from dating might be something that is in service of the change you want to see, right? And I don't think that this is a unilateral thing for everyone. You know, I think some people experience change um, and, and can be in that space in relationship to others where that facilitates growth for them. For others, when they're in a dating situation, um, it becomes too too consuming for them and they're not able to really establish their boundaries well enough that they can show up to that relationship, what I'm gonna call fully self-sovereign, right? So I do think obviously we have a relationship to our environment and I'm not saying don't have a relationship to your environment or to the people in your environment, but being able to have a practice of getting in touch with how we are responding to the environment in any given moment is going to be really good and important information for you to understand, okay, what would actually be 
the next step for me as an individual towards the change I want to see. So for some, it might be like, you know what? I've been a serial monogamist for years. And I'm wondering if in order for me to take a step towards the change I want to see, which in this example could be, let's say, healthier relationships, maybe it requires that I actually spend time on my own so I can discover a few things independent of relationship so that when I come back to relationship, I don't get so subsumed by my partner or by the third thing that gets created between two people, that I can actually hold my own polarity in that circumstance, right? Now that's one person's story. Another person's story might be that they have been avoidant of relationships most of their life, but they've reached a, a point where they're like, you know what, I really want to step into softening and I really wanna step into allowance and I really wanna step into that experience of being connected and playing off someone else and sharing experiences and, for that person, the challenge might be, okay, my next step would be actually trying to date, right? Or it doesn't even have to go straight to dating. It could be connecting with people at meetups who are interested in the same things that I am, that, you know, there might be an opportunity to just naturally test my, my social skills and abilities and softening in a way that feels less threatening, like through shared activities and collaborative efforts. And then that will be a door that wi eventually widens a window of tolerance that eventually widens up enough that I can become comfortable with someone by interacting with them on a regular basis enough that romantic feelings could begin to grow, right? So everybody's going to have a different path and, and, and feeling your way into what actually serves the change you want to see is something that you will very intimately and privately know and understand for yourself, right? Um, it goes up and down. Sometimes I exaggerate. Sometimes I feel it could come up, but it's frozen inside. Hmm. Um, books on EQ, I think emotional. I'm, I'm not sure what EQ is. Attachment boundaries, sure. Um yeah, sometimes it goes up and down. And the other thing too, I just want to validate that for you because it's not a linear process. You know, when we are playing with these things, like we talked about this yesterday, there's periods of engagement and contrast with the external world. And then we take it in and we absorb it and we integrate it into our experience. And then there's periods of engagement with the external world. And then we take it in and we breathe it in and it becomes part of our experience. But every time you go around, I promise you, that circumference is going to get wider. And the further out you go, the more you're going to be able to see. And I do believe almost like the solar system, I think that we all come to this life with some kind of central friction or goal or work that we are here to sort of examine and look at. And if you're here, it's likely that you and I have a similar one, and that is the subject of relationship. And so with every certain, you know, every rotation around that sun, you're going to get a broader perspective and you are going to be looking at things that you've already experienced and you're going to have to go back and experience some of those things that you thought you got over in order for you to understand them in a much broader perspective, right? And, and start understanding them with a higher level of emotional and maybe even spiritual maturity. So I guess what I'm trying to do is normalize that for you. You know, sometimes we think I'm relapsed, I'm this, I'm that, I haven't learned anything, but actually that is part of the process. So if you actually find yourself revisiting old stuff that you thought you got over, I would actually have you remark that as evidence that you are moving forward. <laughs> okay, so here's our last question. What might be one small action step that you could take in the direction of the change that you would like to see today? Just one teeny tiny um, action step, emotional quotient. Yeah, I heard about, I, I heard that before. Okay, yes, EQ, emotional quotient. So one teeny tiny step. There are some really wonderful examples here, like read a book on self-development, watch a video on attachment, um, take time out to meditate, right? Do something that, I might even add to this, something that can activate your body in some way, something that allows you to communicate with your body. I saw um, one thing that I think, and to acknowledge the inner voice, you know, one thing that works for me when I'm feeling frantic is I just take a breath and I just put my hand over my heart and I just say, hi, Brianna. <laughs> I say, hello, Brianna. What's the weather like inside? And I acknowledge that there is there is an aspect of me that is larger than my waking mind. And there is an aspect of me that is so much bigger than anything that I could ever consciously conceive. And, and I ask, what's the weather inside? Because I associate um, air as the element of the heart chakra. And so I think of that as like weather. 
So what is my weather inside? And, and once I know what my weather inside is, then I know what I need to do in order to take care of myself. Um, so I like to think and talk and communicate with myself in metaphor. Um, but, you know, one small thing. Um, leave my apartment and go to a social event or work out of the gym. Yeah, those are great. Try opening up with a close friend. I trust who have been who has been open with me in the past. Those are wonderful suggestions. I love those. I love those. Okay. So thank you for joining me here today and participating in this activity. I'm glad that you've enjoyed these 10 questions. Um, and again, the replay will be available. So if you want to go back and listen to them again, this is actually a practice I go through on a regular basis with myself. Probably not every day, but I do it, you know, when I feel like, um, and I, I'm pretty in touch with myself. So I know like when there's a feeling and it's like my, I start dreaming a certain way, I start being more agitated. I'm like, oh, there's something in there that's asking for attention. And so I'll start going through these questions just as a practice to help me start to be like, okay, so this is what I'm valuing. This is what's coming up for me. This is the feeling I'm feeling in response to that. You know, and sometimes it's a nice way to kind of sift through where you are in any given moment. Um, and exercises like these are Again, these live streams are in promotion of a course that I just launched um, called Relationship Rescue, a toolkit for healthy communication in unstable relationships. And so what I've been doing yesterday and today is giving you some demonstrations of questions, examples, and experiential exercises that go on in the course. And actually in the course, they are in relationship to someone else. This is, of course, more so about being in partnership. Um, so I actually have a partner who does these and demos these with me throughout the course. And we're talking about how do you communicate on a nonverbal level? How do you look at and tease out what is unconditional love versus conditional love? What is, how can I love someone and get them to care about getting my needs met? Is it okay for me to have these needs? And then we talk about boundaries. How do boundaries come into all that and our values and how this all plays out, right? So that is really what the course is all about. And I think what makes this course different is that while we do offer some typical scenarios and ways of responding in the course material, what I really want to teach you how to do is a process by which you can start to access your own authentic experience. And so that the things that you are verbalizing are really coming from your deep, a deep space of inner knowing. It's your own wisdom and it comes from your own heart soul connection to that person. And because attachment is such a nonverbal experience, we focus on the arts based experientials and those types of things to connect with a partner on that nonverbal level. Right. Um, so, again, it's a it's a course that implements the McWilliam method, which is cognitive reframing, body activation and arts based experiential. Today, we've been doing some cognitive reframing. Right. Yesterday, we did arts based and body based experientials. So if you missed yesterday, I invite you to go check out that video. If you're interested in the course, I am offering a Black Friday sale for 40% off um, and that will be available until December 1st. So I invite you to check it out. I actually have a, a long um, video on the info page that walks you through like a downward spiral that a lot of couples find themselves caught in um, and how we break that down. So that's actually sort of an info video if you're interested in learning more about that. And I would love it if you're watching this on the replay to also give me the, your answers to these questions. I would love to see them. And I will be back tomorrow, same time, same place. And we're going to talk about six signs of a secure relationship. So um, thank you so much to everybody here who has joined me. This is great. Oh, here's another one. Start taking water and crystal classes and meditation classes, acupuncture. Those are great. Acknowledge and not procrastinate. Yes. Um, I'm glad you've enjoyed the experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How's the weather inside? A great way to look at it. I'm glad you like that. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yes. Okay, great. I will see you tomorrow. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.